What? Whoa. Hang on, what's the... Wait, no, wait. Ah! Ugh, so this is physics? These intimidating and similar looking formulas are often called the five equations of accelerated motion, or more simply, the five kinematic equations. They are used to solve real world problems where acceleration is constant. Now, disclaimer, if you don't enjoy math, this might not be your cup of tea. As a mathematician, this is my cup of tea. I don't see these as arbitrary equations that we can sub numbers into and just get answers to problems on paper, but rather as relationships that exist between real physical quantities that will allow us to understand other quantities and answer questions about the universe itself. <laughs> Why do people eat laundry soap? Now we're going to look at two of the five equations in this video. And in order for me to keep this brief, you will need an understanding of displacement, velocity, and acceleration to make sense of most of this. We'll also be working with a velocity versus time graph, so it wouldn't hurt if you've seen one of these before. So to understand where our first equation comes from, it helps to look at a graph of velocity versus time. Essentially, this means that we're going to picture an object that is moving with some velocity and graph its motion over time. This object starts with an initial velocity of vi and accelerates, or speeds up, as time progresses until it reaches this final velocity. So we're going to analyze this graph to write an equation that relates a few variables. At the end of all of this, we want an equation that will predict the velocity of our object at any point in time. It makes sense that we'll have vi, vf, and t in our equation, since these are the parameters that are displayed on our graph. Now this graph is linear, so let's start with our friend y equals mx plus b. If we fill in what we know from our graph, you'll see that we actually almost already have a complete equation that will predict the velocity of this object at any point in time. We know our y-axis represents final velocity, and the x-axis represents time, so we can replace x and y with t and vf, respectively. Our object begins its motion with some initial velocity, indicated by this red point. We'll call that vi, and place that in the b position of our equation, which indicates the y-intercept of the graph, or where the line crosses the y-axis. Lastly, we have an unknown slope, and we've also exhausted all of the parameters on our graph, so we need to do some thinking. If we lean on our understanding of slope, which we know to be defined by y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, we'll find our answer to what the slope represents in this case. Remember, this is physics, so all of these parameters actually represent real physical concepts. Now, if we use v for y and t for x and substitute these parameters into our formula for slope, you'll see that we end up with the change in velocity over the change in time. Hmm, change in velocity over the change in time? Where have I heard that before? That's right, acceleration. So wait, the slope of a velocity time graph is acceleration? It sure is. And substituting a in for the slope of our equation results in a nice tidy equation that can be used to predict the final velocity of an object accelerating over time. For the second equation, let's go back to our graph of velocity over time. However, this time, I'm going to draw a few dotted lines underneath the graph to break its area up into two shapes, a triangle and a rectangle. If you have any familiarity with velocity time graphs, you know that the displacement of the object shown in the graph can be found by calculating the area under the graph. <laughs> I am so tempted to go on a tangent about integral calculus here. So we just stumbled across a fun composite shape area problem. Oh, the nostalgia. We know the total area of this shape will be the area of the rectangle we created, plus the area of the triangle we created. Recall that the area of a rectangle can be found by taking its length and multiplying by its width. The length of this rectangle, the long side, can be expressed as t, the total time the object is in motion for, which is shown along the x-axis. The width, or the shorter side, can be expressed as the distance between the x-axis and our point on the y-axis, which we're calling vi. We can use base times height divided by 2, the area formula for a triangle, rewritten with what's depicted on our graph. Now the height of just the triangle portion should be the distance between these two green arrows. Taking vf minus vi will give us this distance. The base of this triangle is the same size as the length of our rectangle, which you'll remember is t. So we have a nice, complex-looking formula that we can actually simplify slightly. We know from our first equation that vf equals at plus vi. Rearranging this equation by bringing vi over to the other side results in vf minus vi 
equals at. So instead of having a vf minus vi in our equation, in its place we could substitute a times t. Multiplying the two t's together results in d equals vit plus one half at squared. Our second kinematic equation, which relates displacement, initial velocity, time, and acceleration. So that's two out of five of the kinematic equations developed. Curious about the rest? Check out the linked video, buckle up and bring your algebra, Batman, because you are in for a whirlwind of mathematical chaos. Thanks for watching.